right now, big snowstorm. And so I'm happy to be here talking about the Chardonnay as a dance. 2018, so what we've been doing now since 2017, half of the production in 16, is keeping the Chardonnay for 17 months on lease. And so there's kind of some idea, like a, a theory behind that craziness, because really when you keep the Chardonnay for 17 months on lease, so 18 months before you bottle it, then it takes a lot of time for the Chardonnay. But what we're looking at here is basically few things, but what we really want to capture is the minerality, the balance of the Chardonnay there in Washington state. I don't want to go too geeky too much in um, like in details, but I think it's really important to touch base on like the malolactic level. So I think first of all, it's gonna be interesting to, as we talk about it, test with me the Chardonnay. So at least you know what we're talking about and it's just not like talk, talk, talk. So I think if you first smell it, you're gonna see that we have a good minerality. And, uh, and then at the same time, some creaminess, almost like brioche in there. And there's a lot of complexity for Chardonnay. You know, it's a, it's, you know, it can be a lot of different things. Sometimes it's really buttery or sometimes it's just a lot of like white blossom or not. And we try here at Long Shadows for the, the dance to just have a lot of layers of different characteristics that comes through and make it more interesting. This so way, just being more lively. And so, when you test it at the same time, I think you're going to see also that that acidity comes across the same way. It comes across the same way as the nose comes. So you definitely have that minerality and whatnot. So a lot of malic acid content in the grapes in Washington state. And when we do full malolactic, which is a second fermentation, so we have like the first fermentation, the alcoholic fermentation, which is the sugar into alcohol. Then what we do, we have a second fermentation, which is a bacteria that takes the malic acid into lactic acid. Malic acid has beautiful acidity, like green apple. And then it goes to lactic acid. And with the lactic acid, it's a lot more creamy, buttery, and not as acidic as at all. So you lose a lot of the balance of the uh, Chardonnay when you do that. And what we want is to retain that brightness. We want brightness in our Chardonnay. We just don't want a like flabby Chardonnay. So what we've done there is just partially malolactic fermentation. What we do, we have about 30% new French oak barrel, about 30% or so uh, used oak barrel, you know, like a used more neutral. And then we have some concrete tank. So on the new barrel, it takes the malolactic beautifully, like that concentration, and that's where you really get the brioche or whatnot. So, so we do full malolactic in the French oak barrel, and you definitely is gonna get that, like, like the brioche we are talking about, the toastiness, some of the creaminess, some of the texture coming through, that's gonna be some from the new barrel with the malolactic. At the same time, we, the same, we don't want to overdo it this way, otherwise it would be just like too much. And we want, again, to keep some of the crispness from the grapes. So we, that's when we go to concrete. And in concrete, we do zero malolactic. And we really try to get more like a whetstone minerality from it. And that's where you really get that acidity when you test it in the mouth. And it just like jumps at you. That's really what comes from the concrete tank there. And, uh, and then just to bring even more layer to it, we have also the used barrel because used barrel always bring that beautiful texture. You know, it doesn't bring as much like a, a barrel, new barrel toastiness, that's too much, but it brings a little bit more texture than concrete. So it's really as its place in the Chardonnay. The grapes at the same time also come from two different vineyards. We've done some clonal selection in one of them at Boucher Vineyard. It's a, the Winte clone. Winte clone carries a little bit larger berries, but beautiful minerality. And that really carries through in this wine right now. And then the other vineyard was planted in the mid eighties. It's called French Creek Vineyard. And that's just beautiful deepness. It's just incredible once we start pressing it and, and, then, um, and, then, um, and then fermenting it, you get that texture from it. And so we do actually a lot of the older vine at French Creek goes to New Barrel and Malolactic. And that's really kind of gonna be the backbone on this wine there. So, so 
So, and all the vineyards are Yakima Valley where we have a little bit more acidity. And so, and that's really why we wanted to keep the wine for 18 months, for 17 months on lease. It was because we don't do full malolactic, you somewhat miss a little bit of the complexity, of the viscosity, of the, the texture in the mouth. And so instead of keeping the Chardonnay only for 10 months in barrel, then we extended it to have more least contact, and the least contact is going to bring you complexity and mouthfeel and viscosity. So we don't need the malolactic to accomplish this. Gilles, that's a, I was going to ask you about the, the time in barrel after you go through the different um, methods of fermentation. You do the three different methods of fermentation, then it goes into barrel, and those barrels that it goes into, if I'm not mistaken, are neutral barrels, right? So we're not imparting any flavors from the oak into the wine, but even then, 17 months, 18 months in barrel, that's a really long time for a white wine, and there's the potential to end up with something flabby or over rich and kind of weighty, but this wine always has that bright, crisp, real freshness to it. And I was wondering if, if that has to do as well with the sourcing of where we get the fruit. I know Boucher Vineyard is cooler climate, um, maybe a little bit more acidity. Does that help preserve some of the liveliness in the wine as well? Absolutely. And we are actually, the French Creek is also not far away from Boucher in the Yakima Valley with much cooler nights, cooler days. And uh, we can really enhance a little bit more that acidity is a balance of the wine. We really don't want to lose that crisp balance, lively balance of the Chardonnay. And when we keep it for all this time in barrel, it's not gonna change the malolactic level anymore because we are able to cut the malolactic at uh, 50% or so. I'm not really cutting because a new barrel goes 100%. I don't really like to stop a malolactic. So once it starts in a barrel, I let it go all the way but then on the concrete, then we don't do it at all. And that's where we get the bad minerality there. So what about the two vineyards that we source from? I know we've got the French Creek, which is one of the oldest in the state, mm -hmm. but then we've got Boucher as the um, other vineyard that, that you source from. What are the different maybe flavor characteristics that you like from each of the two vineyards? So I think um, the Boucher, again, is going to bring a little bit more of that minerality. And so most of the time, Boucher is going to be in the concrete. And because it's the Winte clone, the clonal selection of the Winte, and, uh, and then the French Creek is going to have all this kind of white pitch, a lot, a lot of honeysuckle and white pitch, and much kind of a uh, little bit richer, not exotic because it's still the Yakima Valley, but a little bit deeper on flavors for sure. Gotcha. We're starting to get some um, people joining the chat line here and people are talking about food and different pairings and we had suggested actually Alan one of his favorite dishes to have with the dance Chardonnay is uh, a scallop dish a seared scallop dish and um, we've got other people on the chat line agreeing that it's a, a great uh, pairing and I think that to me anyways it's the wine it, it, scallops are a lot like this wine there's a richness to the scallops but they're also a very delicate dish. And same thing with this wine is, is there's a richness to the wine, but it has that freshness, that liveliness to it. And definitely like a lemon character that when you pair it with scallops, the, the, the marriage between the two is, is fantastic. Yeah, yeah. There is a, also in the Chardonnay quite a bit of, of a kumquat character. And so you could almost like, uh, like uh, start cooking a little bit of the kumquat and then put the scallops on top of it and you can have the but citrusy and the kind of creaminess that you find again in to the Chardonnay as well. Chardonnay. Chardonnay. Sí, están Chardonnay. Sí. Entre Chardonnay, Sagi y el so, um, <laughs> any more question you think on the Chardonnay? Uh, let's see. Um, no, I think we're good. I think we could go on to the Sagi next. Okay, yeah, and uh, Saji is another great wine actually for food. I love that brightness and all the red fruit. And actually, in the 2017 vintage, which was a little bit cooler vintage actually, but the darkness of the fruit the profile in the Saji is just incredible. So basically, it uh, started in 2004 with Giovanni Polonari and. What we really want is for the Sanjo Vese to be the dominant character of this wine with a little bit more red fruit, but in 2017 at the same time, kind of a summer, summer uh, 
uh, darker fruit and, um, and even anise, like some of that spiciness there. And so what we do is San Giovese has that beautiful, refined, sophisticated flavor profile, but sometimes miss a little bit of structure. So we have some Cabernet Sauvignon to be able to bring up the tannins and the texture, the mouthfeel and everything. And then we have some Syrah into, into it as well. And then with the Syrah, which on this one is 17% Syrah, then we're gonna bring some darkness and just one more layer to the wine. So it makes a more complete wine, yet the Sangiovese just takes over and brings that vibrant character and, and definitely just like lifts uh, the entire uh, blend there. Yeah, I, I agree. It's, I mean, one of the many things that I like about this wine is how versatile it is. I think it's probably our most versatile wine as far as all the different dishes that it pairs well with. It works with chicken, it works with seafood, uh, it works with steak, and, and that has to do with that Sangiovese component. And um, for those of you that aren't familiar with Sangiovese, it is kind of an unknown or undiscovered varietal, but if you've ever had a bottle of Chianti from Italy, Sangiovese is actually the predominant grape that goes into making Chianti, and, uh, which are fantastic food wines. So Sangiovese typically, you know, it's going to be a little bit lighter bodied. It's going to have more of that live, liveliness, more of that acidity, kind of more of that high toned red fruit, um, like wild strawberries or cherries, unlike those like darker blue fruits or, or purple fruits. And so might not have quite the, the full body or the concentration of a Cabernet or Merlot, um, which is why we blend in the Cabernet to give it more structure, give it a little more backbone. Um, and then uh, the Syrah adds all that wonderful spice on the finish. But um, that's why I, I love this wine um, with food. And, and in particular, I had recommended the um, wild mushroom and pork jowl pasta that we had discovered at a Volterra restaurant here in Seattle, actually. Yeah, okay. um, yeah, it, um, the, the Sangiovese, you know, with all that, that bright acidity, it stands up to and cuts through all that kind of rich, buttery, fatty goodness that, from the pork. And then the, um, the, the Syrah on the finish has that savoriness that, that goes great with the mushrooms. And so um, if you haven't tried the recipe, uh, my wife, Sarah, posted it on the invitation that came with the email for today's tasting. It's from... Um, um, who's it from? I forget. Well, it's not Vol Volterra, but um, I forget. I forget whose recipe it is, but we've tweaked it a little bit. We make it quite a bit here. It's fantastic. Um, and I highly suggest that you check it out. Mm -hmm. And uh, definitely with a wild mushroom, there's a little bit of some notes of healthiness into it, but it's very so bright and very uplifting. It makes people happy to bring the sashi because it's just like so up like this. And um, so basically, we have a couple of vineyards into it. We have uh, some of the Sangiovese come from Candy Mountain, which is a new AVA right next to the Red Mountain and brings that beautiful texture there. And we have also actually some uh, Sangiovese coming from Boucher Vineyard that was planted in 1998. And um, it's more like a pergola somehow, how the, 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 the canopy. Uh, goes like a pergola and so you have it's protected from the direct sun so there is no sunburn and sunburn could really lower the intensity of the color pigmentation in the wine so it's like that bright color not necessarily was intense just like very bright and uh, and uh, at the same time we can really retain a lot of the brightness in the in the of the tannins because the phenols don't get burned out so this it's so that's somehow well, how we can retain some of that liveliness into the Saji. Gio, maybe um, talk a little bit about the uh, Sagne um, method that you use to add a little bit of concentration to the wines. Yeah, so, so the Sangiovese is kind of a hard to grow, hard to make. And one of the main characteristics for Sangiovese is to be juicy. You know, it's like a little bit larger berries, a little bit more juicy. And at the same time, the skin don't carry a lot of uh, color pigmentation necessarily, more like Pinot Noir, does not have a lot of richness and uh, doesn't have a lot of structure really. It's just a beautiful, elegant grapes. So for us to be able to make a sagi with a little bit more hump in, in, in behind it, you know, a little bit more structure, a little bit more backbone, we actually 
crush the grapes once it comes into the winery and we drain quite a bit of juice out. So sometimes like depending on how juicy it is, we drain 5%, 10% juice out of the tank. So what's remaining in the tank is a higher ratio of skin compared to the, the juice. So now we're gonna be able to do a lot of more extraction of the color and the flavors, the tannins into less amount of juice. So higher concentration and better mouthfeel, better color. And that's kind of a expensive way to do it. But in the other hand, it just makes the wine so much deeper. And that's how senior is, is by removing the juice out of the skin. Senior actually means like bleeding. So we bleed the tank out of the juice. And uh, then we use a uh, old French oak barrel for uh, 18 months. So it's then aged 18 months in French oak barrel. And that just brings up even a little bit more layer of complexity as well. I, I also know, Gilles, when we first started making this wine, um, and it's always been a blend of Sangiovese, uh, Cabernet, and Syrah in different percentages. But it was always equal parts, for the most part, equal parts Sangiovese and equal parts Cabernet. But over the years, it seems like we've been dialing up the, the composition of um, Sangiovese and, and reducing a little bit of the Cabernet. And does that have to do with the fact that the Sangiovese become a little bit more, um, I don't know, kind of rich and structured and, and, and more full bodied and we're not relying so much on the Cabernet or does that have to do with a different sourcing now than, than you used to? Yeah, well, I think it's uh, definitely many things that came at once, and uh, we don't screw up any much. In, uh, we don't screw it up too much anymore by making sense of it. You know what I mean by that is, it definitely comes from the vineyard as a beginning, and in the vineyard as a beginning, we wanted to <clears throat> try to stress the vines a little bit by planting it in a fractured basalt. So in the fractured basalt, the thing is the canopy was not strong enough to support the fruit. Uh, zone uh, to all the all the load of the fruit will not ripen well, so we would have to put more water to keep the canopy going for better photosynthesis, and then pretty soon it was more like hydroponic. We put more water to try to get the foliage going, but then it will just make bigger clusters. So we actually had to yank all the vines out. We removed the Saint Giovese planted Cabernet Sauvignon instead, and then we went to Candy Mountain and Boucher Vineyard. We did some long-term contract with two of the best growers that we could find for San Giovese. And that's where with more gravelly soil, we were really able to control the vigor of the plant. And instead of being very vigorous and putting so much energy into the cluster and producing like big berries, we were able to just like stress it just enough where we were able to get more like loose clusters, small berries, and we bring it to the winery. We don't have to do as much senior because the berries are already smaller, less juicy, and we had a beautiful physiological maturity of the phenols because of that as well. So this really helped to bring up the concentration of the Saint Giovese in the blend of Sagi. And at the same time, we also learned a little bit more of some winemaking tricks at the winery, like bleeding, but also keeping the wine in contact with the skin for much longer. At the beginning, we were trying to extract maybe the, the tannins a little bit too fast because we knew that if so much had to be extracted within like two or three weeks period of time. So what I do now actually, I'm trying to be very gentle on how I do the extraction of the color, the flavors and the tannins into the juice, but I keep it up to like 40 days on, on skin and juice together. So a long maceration where we're gonna get that mouthfeel and that, because that kind of viscosity the, the, in the mouthfeel, yet we, without having like harsh tannins somehow. And uh, that's kind of, we were able to play different, on different level to have a better San Giovese. And with better San Giovese, we then brought up the concentration of San Giovese to the Sagi to be able to have that like, uplifting sensation when you test Sagi. Got it. Lots of questions coming in now. People are very interested to know what you do with the extra Sangiovese after you bleed it out of the tanks. Does some of that go to the Nine Hats label? That's a great question. Um, but uh, so it kind of depends. But the thing is, when I do bleed, so do the Sagi, of the juice, what I want to do is as 
quick as possible because then as soon as we have crushed it and there is a skin and the juice in contact together, then we have some of the color, some of the tan and some of the richness that start going leaching into the juice. So as soon as we crush it, it goes into the tank. I open the valve right away. So there is absolutely nothing in the juice. It's just like white wine. And, and there is not much to do with that juice, actually. So quite often it just like goes down the drain. And I had to say that. But <laughs> because the thing is, we, we get all the good stuff back in the tank. And there is it's just like basically sugary water at that point, you know. Gotcha. Well, I should probably mention um, on these vintages, we've the last couple of tastings that we've been doing have been verticals. And so we've been dipping into the library and working with very limited uh, supply and inventory with those wines. But the nice thing about each of these vintages are they're all our current vintages. So if there's anything that anybody particularly likes, the good news is there's still availability uh, on the website until they're sold out. We have uh, Magnums as well as 750s of each of the red wines. Anything else we want to add about the uh, Saji? Well, you were talking about a little bit uh, older wines and I, the Saji has just been incredible how well it sells actually. I, I've been personally surprised like uh, opening some bottle of Saji from like 05, 06, 07 and they're still stunning, just getting better with a little bit more healthiness and, and um, and uh, and almost graphite character, but still with that like like uh, like you were saying like wild strawberries, like a nice ripe wild strawberry character to it. I just love it actually. Yeah, we uh, we last night decided to try the beef uh, bourguignon recipe that you suggested with the pirouette, but we had a bottle of 2008 Saji here as well. So we opened that, tasted it with it, and like you said, it, it's aging fantastic. You know, I was pretty close to your place. You should invite me, right? <laughs> You're always welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ian, let me see if there's any other questions, and maybe we should jump to the pirouette next. Um, yeah, we could probably uh, move on to the pirouette. Okay. And, um, so, and yeah, pirouette is always a very fun wine as well to make. And uh, actually, wow, when you smell it right now, it smells of pirouette, it's like shifting gear right there, right away. With We're going from saji, that's just like, was so jumping with red fruit. Now it's just like deep and layered and complex. So, so much like very black cherry, like Bing cherries or not. Mm. And, uh, and we have that incredible texture, structure in the mouth. It's firm, but in a beautiful way. And still it's very young wine when you think about it. I don't know if uh, probably most of you guys were able to decant the wine. When you do decanting, it's I like to do it gently ahead of time, like one hour, two hours, three hours ahead of time. But I usually like to do it gently. Like, you know, as a winemaker, when we make the wine in the cellar, it's really important for us to just always try to stay away from oxidation and we're very gentle. And so usually when I open a wine like this, I try not to shake the decanter too hard, you know, I just let it breathe and open very nicely. And now what we get out is all these like delicate flavors coming through, even though it's a lot of black cherry and, and even some uh, bittersweet chocolate to it, but it's all integrated together. And I think one of the main wine making techniques that we do is uh, to achieve that kind of flavor there is um, barrel fermentation. And so basically what we do, all the Cabernet Sauvignon is sourced from the Red Mountain. So already quite a bit of tannins. Red Mountain has a beautiful backbone there. And we put that into a little, little bit larger barrels for fermentation. So like a regular barrel is 225 liter, like 60 gallon. And we ferment it in 400 liter on barrels. And what that does when we do the fermentation in there, you get that integration of the black fruit and the tannins, and you get some, also some of uh, the toastiness of the barrel that just goes all together. So when you're able to do it really early on like this in the fermentation of the grapes, the integration is the best that you can get there. And uh, so it's really 
it's, it takes a lot of hand power to do it because it's like you know, we do like basically not even half a ton at a time fermentation. And but so at the, at the beginning, yes. I was going to say, I think what's most interesting about that fermentation process is once you put it into those 400 liter um, barrels is that you're turning those by hand and that you're rotating them in order to get that general extraction of color and, and flavor, but also um, really soft, supple tannin so that it, it's textural. But just the amount of labor that goes into, it's, it's, it's unique. I mean, it, that's a unique fermentation process where we have you know, part of the production team actually turning these barrels on, on um, racks where, where they can stay stationary, but you're turning the barrels manually. Maybe you want to talk a little bit about that process. Yeah, for sure. And that's very true, actually. That's a very important part of the process where, again, out of a red fermentation, what we're trying to do is a maceration of the skin and the juice together to be able to extract the colors, the tannins, the, the flavors out from the skin into the juice. So most of the, so the thing is the skin floats on top of the juice. So we need to do some extraction process and and where we have to pump the uh, the juice from the bottom of a tank to the top you know we call that pump over some of them do also just punch down and what we do in this case like then was saying is we're able to just do a very gentle rotation so instead of like pumping the juice or doing like a, a mechanical action of a punch down into the, the grapes we just like rotate the barrel and and this way it also puts all the leaves back in suspension. So it's all kind of that mixing of the barrel and, uh, and just brings up that integration I was talking about because of that. And, and the mouthfeel that gets out of that is it's, it's basically becomes the backbone of the period that you test in, uh, in the wine there, that mid palette there. Yeah, I have all of our wines. I'm always amazed with this one. It's such a textural wine. And I know that Philippe, um, our partner on this wine, is all about achieving texture in the wines. But even when they're young, you know, a lot of young wines can be kind of hot and tannic and abrasive. But um, this wine is always so soft and silky, even right on release. I mean, we just, you know, not too long ago released the 2017. Mm -hmm. And it's just beautiful and silky um, and soft. Is there a reason? I was wondering, um, I know we, we use that process for fermenting Cabernet in the barrel, but with the other red varietals that go into this blend, is there a reason that we only ferment Cabernet that way and not the Merlot or Cap Franc or? I think, um, I think, you know, we definitely, and we do for some of our vintage select, ferment some of the Syrah uh, in this, and that works really well in Syrah. And for the pedestal, for, on some of the vintage select, and we also do some, uh, some Merlot in open, uh, we just use a regular barrel and we pop up the head and we do fermentation in barrel there as well. Um, so it's just that the Cabernet Sauvignon brings all that structure and it has enough backbone behind it to uh, sustain a lot of gentler uh, extraction because it's you know just rotating the barrel. We don't have that mechanical action. So when we take Cabernet Sauvignon from the Red Mountain, but an AVA, an appellation that's already has that structure behind it. We're not afraid of the structure at all because we know it's there. So we're just able to bring up the integration of a firm uh, mid palette, but at the same time, so refined at the same time, just brings all that refined texture. Right. Well, a um, couple questions coming in now. So, um, Someone was curious whether or not that, that um, rolling of the barrels is unique to long shadows, but also um, is that the same as racking? Maybe you want to explain the difference. Uh, so, so probably on the first question, I'd say that not a lot of people use it. I mean, nowadays, no, nothing is just like, you know, there's many winemakers probably using it in the other hand. It's so, and it takes so much hand power to do it and so much space. I mean, you need a lot of space for all these barrels and it takes forever to rotate it. And it takes at the same time four clip to be able to lift the barrels after and, and bring all the juice out and the skin out. It's a lot of work. And, and if we do it, it's because it makes the wine that good. Otherwise it will be like, no way, I'm not gonna do it. Because, but we're all about quality. So what I'm saying there is that 
not everybody can do it because of the space, because of the manpower of the time, but we put so much effort into it that we're able to do it. Um, it's pretty rare to see winery doing it to the extent we do. Um, it is probably kind of the opposite from a racking though, because when we do rotate the barrel, as we were talking about, we put everything back into suspension, like all the leaves and even the seeds, you know, which probably would be the only thing that we have to be really careful with is when we do the rotation of the barrel, it's still very gentle, but all the seeds comes back in suspension as well. So we really have to be conscientious of not extraction too, too, too much extraction of seed tannins, which are a lot more harsh. So that's one thing that we really have to keep an eye on. But when we do the racking of a wine is when we let the wine settle, when it gets really clean and all the sediment comes to the bottom of the barrel. And then what, what you do, you rack, all the wine out, all the clean wine out, and you leave the sediment in the bottom of the barrel of the tank, and then you wash up the sediment out. So, so what we do is totally the opposite. We mix everything out. Right. And then maybe you want to talk a little bit about um, this wine's unfined, unfiltered, correct? Yes. Yeah. So, so and that's true for you know, all our red wine, all our core wines. They are unfine and unfiltered so unfine for sure we don't put uh, egg white or anything like this too because we have already a beautiful quality of the tannins it all starts really in the vineyard you know when we can really achieve that physiological maturation with a good photosynthesis and just enough sun access on the grapes and everything we have beautiful tannins and and when you do fining then you drop a lot of tannins you drop mid palate you drop the richness you drop the complexity and we do not want to do fining we don't need it for the filtration we don't do tight filtration because we keep our wine very clean at the winery you come and you can eat on the floor you know it's like it's like it's uh, it's just bad clean but the thing is what we use at bottling we but a filter, we do a little filtration. What we call it is the bud catcher. So if there's like a fly or whatever, we call it the bud catcher in between winemakers. And so it's a basically a 10 micron and it does not like clean up the wine. It's just like an extra insurance, you know. Right. Because the tighter filters are going to strip some of those tannins, some of the weight, some of the color, some of the flavor from yes. the wines. For sure. Right. Well, maybe we should talk a little bit about the uh, pairings for this wine. I know you have a couple favorites. Yeah. So, so you know, and I know it's going to be a Valentine and everything. And nobody, the truth of the matter is nobody wants like a big meat stew on the table, you know, for, for, for Valentine. But what I'm thinking about that, though, is maybe to cut the meat in a little bit larger pieces and, uh, and do the burgundy like this. And, um, and then more toward the end uh, what i like is to put some you know, a little bit of garlic and uh, and some parsley and i kind of on the side of the burgundy i put some beautiful mushroom that i you know in a, a fried pan and then i put it in the burgundy and what i love doing from the beginning of the cooking of the burgundy i like leave it all day i put that's my own little touch i put bone marrow into it and so the so now for the plate with a pirouette, what I'm seeing is not like the stew, but putting on a plate a nice piece of meat that would be like maybe one one and a half inch or two inch, and a nice carrot, a little bit of uh, the the mushrooms there, and like a toast of the bone marrow right there. So just like a beautiful touch with some uh, parsley just like on top of it, and uh, you know we can make it burgundy deep as that richness and it has a lot of flavor to it. It's really deep. And because of the uh, pirouette having so much like depth to it, I think it would be a perfect pairing, not just like the stew, but just like the texture of it. It, it definitely was. Last night, I, you know, we had the 08 Saji um, and it, it was great. It, the wine was great, but we were doing side by side with the pirouette and the pirouette was definitely the better pairing. Mm. Should have just listen to you. <laughs> Come on, then. I thought you could. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah. Um, but, uh, what about, we should probably talk a little bit about the blend, too. I, 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 we, we mentioned that it's, um, you know, it's a classic Bordeaux blend. Mm -hmm. But for this particular vintage, um, it's 58% Cabernet, 20 Merlot, 13 Malbec and nine Petit Verdot. 
Um, obviously that changes vintage in and vintage out depending on what you're able to source and what you like. And I think, I mean, I can't remember if we had Cab Franc in there at one time as well. Sometimes we do. Yeah. So, so basically, uh, that's very true. Uh, our pirouette is uh, like that Bordeaux blend. And so all Bordeaux varietals, you know, like Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Malbec, Petit Verdot, and definitely Cap Franc when it fits, uh, we can make a much more layered wine, much more complex, more. And, uh, and so the Cabernet Sauvignon always bring again that backbone we've been talking about. And the Merlot, a little bit more soft and juicy or whatnot. Is Merlot brings beautiful layer to this pirouette there. And the Malbec, that's probably the most Malbec we've used. Sometimes Malbec, I love Malbec and it's spicy and the color in Malbec is incredible. It's always so dark, so deep, so purple. And, um, and the thing is, sometimes it lacks a mid palette. So it does not always make it to pirouette because of that mid palette that it's lacking. And, uh, and then actually Petit Verdot, 9% this year, and it's anywhere between 8% and we went all the way up to like 15% in some year and to really lift the wine up. So I love Petit Verdot in pirouette. But what we do is we look at the vintage and we look at all the components we have on the table and we just do the best blend we can trying to make a solid wine, like very layered wine again. So, so it's kind of a very fun wine to be able to blend because we are able to have so many of these Bordeaux varietals to play with. I know the varietals change um, year over year. How about the uh, vineyard sourcing? I know we get a lot from Red Mountain. Mm -hmm. um, I think we always have, but um, are you changing much of the sourcing as far as vineyards? No, not at all. It's really important for us to be able to stay um, constant with uh, with the style, but also with the growers. It takes a lot of time to work with the growers and get to know a grower, and it takes a lot of time for the grower to know the winemaker as well. We have that relationship and with our growers that's so important, and uh, because every winemaker is different, and, and they need to know what we want, and so for that, we do long-term contract, acreage contract uh, with some of our best growers. And this way, year after year, we get the same grapes from the same block, from the same vines, and we know what to expect. That being said, if some of the vintage, uh, a certain block didn't quite make it quality-wise or style-wise to go into pirouette, then it stays on the table and doesn't go in the blend. That's why we have nine hats. Then it goes to nine hats. And, uh, but otherwise, we're always able to keep the same grapes. And of course, at the same time, when we see that there is a special clonal selection block being planted, uh, we're able to put our foot forward and do some contract even in young vines, because at the beginning, the young vines are gonna go to nine hats as well. And then once it gets a little bit more mature and we understand how to make the wine, then this can go to feather or pirouette or our core wines. Right. Um, Larry was asking here if we go back and taste previous vintages in order to determine our current vintage blends. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that more has to do with whatever qualities you're, you're finding in the current vintage and, and each of the um, different areas that you source from in order to come up with each of the, those blends. It's not dependent on anything that we've done in the past, right? Well, <clears throat> A little bit of a little bit of both. It's for sure that we're gonna make the best wine we can, but sometimes it's like you can go kind of a couple different directions in the style of the wine, and the quality is still gonna to be top notch. And then at that point, it's like okay, let's open a couple uh, year prior and see what kind of a flow, uh, flavor profile we were getting back then. And sometimes actually it influence how we're gonna make the decision on how to blend because of how it tested before in different vintages. If it makes sense. Got it. Any other questions on the chat board here? See if there's anything else. Um, any new projects? You know, I don't know if everyone, um, knows or not. I mean, the dance is a fairly new project for us, but um, just last year, we introduced a Sauvignon Blanc 
and we make very little of it, only about 500 cases, but we make a Sauvignon Blanc now called Symbol, and that's available on the website. That's a fairly new project. But nothing else in the works. Obviously, if, if you're a club member, there's always new wines that we create just for our club members. Um, we do some vintage select wines, very small production, um, and those come out. Usually those are library wines where those have been uh, aged for quite a while, but um, those aren't available at retail. Um, like I said, they're just for club members, but those are always new and different. But aside from that, we don't have any other um, projects that we're working on. Um, we're getting kind of close to the one hour mark here, so we should probably start wrapping things up and people can start their weekends. Um, if you do have questions, feel free to send them and, and we will definitely get to them and, and uh, send you a reply and a response. And as always, we'd love it if you kept in touch with us on social media. I'm sure Sarah will post all of our social media handles so that you can stay in touch with us. And um, before we disconnect here though, um, I would I'd like to see if we can pull off a group toast here again. Um, and to do that, I would suggest switching back to the gallery view. Don't unmute your microphones uh, just yet, but we'll get everybody to raise a glass. And um, Jill, do you have anything else you wanna add? Um, not really. It's been awesome, you know, to be able to do this virtual testing and hopefully pretty soon I'm going to see much more of you guys and, you know, cheers and everybody stays healthy. All right. Well, thank you all again for joining us. We uh, appreciate your support now more than ever. Uh, stay well, stay positive and uh, have a great weekend. Cheers. 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 Thank you. 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 you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Jana, hello. Hi. 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 Guys are awesome. Thank you, everybody. Come back for the next one. She doesn't want to be in. What are you doing? What are you going to do? Oh, there you go. Happy Valentine's Day, everyone. Happy Valentine's Day. Oh, okay. Valentine. Oh, happy Valentine's Day. Ready? I have my my present right here. Right here, right here. No, Here's my favorite. It's my favorite. It's a terrible time. 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 It's a <laughs> Happy Valentine's Day. 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 I was like, I'd be happy with a pizza and my husband watching a horror movie. So I got you that shirt. On here got me. Oh, yeah. oh that's a good one too. That's brilliant. <laughs> sort of. I feel like I should probably have that. <laughs>
Yeah. 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 What does that make me? Richard minus one? Or yeah. Richard plus one? Sure does. Leave me be. I'm going to turn this off. All right. Cheers, everyone. Cheers. 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 Night, everyone. Oh, hurry. Bye. Bye.